Next curve. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Rethink Podcast. I'm Leonard Lee, Managing Director of Next Curve, and today I have a very fine guest joining me today to talk about U.S. technological leadership. How are we situated globally? Are we still the leader? And what are the risks and remedies that we need to consider to sustain our tech leadership? And so today, uh, Roger, welcome. We have Roger Entner of Recon Analytics. And, um, you know, uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here. And I was wondering if you might take a moment to share a little bit of your history and some of the work that you do at Recon Analytics. Sure. Thank you very much for having me. It's really uh Pleasure, honor, and privilege, right? So at Recon Analytics, we do research, consulting, market analysis for telcos and media and entertainment companies and companies that do business with them. And so we do pretty nifty nifty things in that regard. And uh, I started Recon... Um, uh, in uh, 2011. Uh, before that, I was uh, head of telecom research for Nielsen, which was at the time the uh, the largest market research provider, both in the US and, and globally. Uh, I've done research. Before that, we I came to, uh, uh, to Nielsen through an acquisition. Uh, I worked for uh, a company called IAG Research before we did effectiveness measurement of uh, advertising. And so I helped all the, the wireless providers, which were the second largest uh, advertisers after the automobile industry, uh, help do better advertising. So if what ads work and what ads don't work and when should you take them off the air and all of that stuff. So I did that for all the four providers. Before that, I was running North American Telecom for uh, Ovum, which was uh, which is now Omdia, right? Before that, I ran uh, the North American Carrier Group for, for the Yankee Group, which uh, got bought by 451 and now is part of S&P uh, Global. And I think now it gets too old and boring. Okay. And- I've been around well, a few times. You know, Roger, I'll tell you right now, it, it's really my honor <laughs> given that wonderful legacy. I mean, geez, you're like the history of telco industry research. It's it, and, 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 you know, to be very honest, I'm a big fan. Uh, I've been following Recon Analytics for a while as well as, well as your work, and it, it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. Your analysis is great. Uh, so for our audience... If you don't know who Roger is, uh, you better know. Uh, and if you don't know Recon Analytics, well, that's something else that you need to know. So wonderful having you here. And I'm really excited uh, to have this conversation with you today. So um, what we're going to be covering, so I just want to set the stage for our audience here. There's going to be four things that we're going to cover today, um, primarily uh, the four agenda items that we have. Uh, are, uh, number one, what is the competitive position of the U.S. tech industry? And then we'll have a little bit of a chat on what are the key risks to leadership in today's environment, today's very exciting and volatile environment, Uh, and how does the U.S. tech industry sustain leadership? And then finally, we'll cap uh, the discussion off with some uh, maybe recommendation to policy uh, makers on how they can support uh, competitive innovation. So if that doesn't sound, uh, you know, too boring for you, Roger, you know, yeah, it is exciting, isn't it? It, It's actually the only thing that matters at this moment. Uh, People might not realize that. So um, why don't we, why don't we kick 
things off with our for, first bullet item here, which is, or discuss, um, discussion item, which is what is the competitive position of the U.S. tech industry? And, you know, I know, uh, Roger, you focus a lot on a telco, but as you mentioned before, um, you also address, uh, I mean, you are really looking at, uh, at a, a broader scope of things, right? You, you know, you um, have a lot of conversations with technologies that uh, technology firms and um, different layers of the tech industry that feed into the telco industry. So, um, you know, uh, what are your, some of your thoughts on our position in the U.S. as a, a tech leader? And maybe let's start off with clarifying what does it mean to be a technology leader? Well, technology leader means that innovations and more, more importantly, not only innovations, but inventions happen here, yeah. right? Uh, and inventions are things that haven't been seen before. Right. And innovations are then improvements on that original thought, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, I love uh, Steve Jobs' quote that um, it's not the, that it's not the job of consumers uh, to tell businesses what they want, right? Uh -huh. That's innovation. When consumers right. tell you what they want, that's innovation. Right. But Steve Jobs and his team inventing the iPhone. Yeah. You don't need to, because, you know, they don't know that. It's like, you know, Henry Ford said, you know, if I would have done, uh, ask people what they wanted, they would have said, you know, uh, a better horse carriage, not yeah. a car, right? So the U.S. is very good in invention, mm -hmm. and it has to protect that. And we are still at the, at the leadership here. Mm -hmm. Now, in innovation, our leadership has, has eroded, and uh, partially because our, of our own fault, because... We have engaged in a Faustian bargain with, for example, China, where if you want to have access to the Chinese market, you have to give them access to your inventions mm. on which they can then innovate and deliver and build it often cheaper. Mm. And so what we have to do is protect our inventions and accelerate the pace of invention, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not just of innovation. So it's about that leadership and then expanding on it right that that's the key part yeah and i i'll generally agree with your your statements there i mean the the only i guess the only adjustment that i would make is i typically look at uh an innovation as being the application of um inventions right so as you mentioned there's um invention where you have investments in r d and fundamental technologies and sciences that then um create basically new technologies technologies that we haven't seen before and um you're absolutely right uh, the U u.s has been basically the bastion of of invention for the uh, since world war ii basically right yes before that it was germany and then yeah things happened and a lot of people left and right. moved here and but right. and it moved here beforehand already uh the u.s has always uh for the longest time being a leader mm -hmm. of invention and and our patent books have really underlied that and you know semiconductors were invented here right uh, the internet was invented here all of that foundational ip right without it our uh life as we know it today would not exist right right and, and so we have to keep working on on that and protect and then do the application as well but right. at the same time you know we can't we can't rest on our laurels and right. you know the us is rightly proud on uh Mm -hmm. proud of its uh if of its history right. and things. but right. rah rah we're number one leads usually to complacency right you know, you right yeah. yeah then uh then things go go wrong right uh and when you look at it 
how many Americans want to do uh, STEM and do original invention, that number gets smaller and smaller. Right, and right. Uh, that is undermining our advantage. And unless we we then import, uh, you know, the smartest people around the world, that difference will get smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and agree. And I'm I'm glad that you're making this distinction, um, or at least highlighting that invention is the core of tech technological leadership. Because I think sometimes we, uh, you know, folks get. Um, confused uh, between uh, technological leadership and then the market leadership in the tech industry, right? So if you think about, for instance, uh, the market share in semiconductor manufacturing versus design versus the and market stuff, um, you know, that's a different story, right? That That is, um, you know, there's a lot of technology, obviously, that goes into those narratives or those, uh, the, those markets, uh, but that is, is something that we also need to consider in, in separation. It's not necessarily, let's say, um, the same policy for invention as it is for um, commercializing those technologies that are coming out of the invention economy, if you will, into end market. And um, that's, I think, a dynamic that sometimes gets uh, confused and conflated at times. So thank you for that. That's very great. It sounds simple, but you know, I, I, I read a lot of material stuff out there just like you and it's it's a point of confusion that comes up quite often yeah and, and both go hand in hand right you, yeah absolutely yeah you know the, the 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 fax machine got invented in 1840s right yeah. mm -hmm. there, was, there was like a three-year overlap where the fax, where a, a, a japanese samurai could have sent a fax to abraham lincoln right mm -hmm. uh but nobody used it, right? The invention was there, but the innovation around it was not, and right. didn't make it practical, right? Right. So, right. Uh, innovation has certainly a, a, a role, but it's a lot easier and adaptable, and we we have to be leaders in both. Right. And, right. And we we also have to recognize, and I think the U.S. has done this, uh, that that the true value add is in in the not in making things but coming up with things right, right. When, you right. Look at the, when you look at the iphone right yeah uh and and where value is being added it's a thousand dollar iphone <laughs> it's around 195 dollar components uh -huh. and uh, that that get shipped into china uh -huh. And then it gets assembled for five dollars, right? And then overseas or wherever. Yeah. So, so the guys in in Cupertino created eight hundred eight hundred dollars roughly of value in this, right? Uh, while sitting in a spaceship, right? Yeah. Uh, and and so it's important to see where things where things happen, right? Uh, by the way, when you look at our balance of trade. Uh -huh. It counts as a one thousand dollar export from China. Uh -huh. you, that's why, for example, balance of trade conversations are uh -huh. very misguided because I, I, I agree. Value yeah. in the end, not the value add. Right? right, right, exactly. And you know, designed in Cupertino, right? I think that that's really telling because if you really look at the value in the semiconductor industry, uh, whether it's uh, you know revenue in terms of revenue or even valuation. Uh, even though I, I like to avoid the valuation conversation, but let's just talk about the revenue share uh, design by a large margin outstrips, uh, you know, manufacturing, for instance. And there's a lot of attention to manufacturing, but the differentiation in the industry is happening at a higher level, especially with the leading edge stuff, right? Whether it's from the standpoint of, uh, you know, IP design or, um, you know, the, these new 
um, these new technologies and opportunities for building these new types of systems. And we're seeing that with even a with Apple, right? With the advent of the, the M1 series of chips where they're taking the ARM architecture and now they're very quickly evolving their own uh, chips that are geared toward um, you know, devices that are, let's call it um, up, sort of up market. Taking it to the next level, right? Yeah, taking it to the next level, but that that's design, right? And they're leveraging a lot of the technologies that are available through TSMC and, and the manufacturers to make these designs happen. But without Apple, a, a lot of the actual device, that device innovation is not going to happen. That invention is not going to happen, right? Because yeah, they, yeah. they own the channel for commercialization, which is that market. Yes. And, and so manufacturing only becomes important when, when the, the location becomes yeah. uh, threatened, right? And, yeah. and that's the big fear that, that we talked about is what happens if if that supply chain gets physically disrupted? We see right. it. We see it. The threat of it. We see it in in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. and we're seeing it in reality play out in China, uh, in in Russia, right? Right, right, right. Uh, around Ukraine, mm -hmm. and and the interdependence of that, uh, you know, is going to become more and more apparent especially china will uh, no sorry uh russia oh, will yeah. be be that case study of what happens when when the supply chain uh tears yeah and it goes down the drain mm -hmm. because yes they they will run out of spare part for planes i i said like i said last night uh among, among friends is like Russia is becoming, uh, due to this conflict, a lot bigger, not in size, but in how long it will take to come from one place to the other, because planes will stop flying. Mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah, yeah. And for example, they switched a couple of years ago, or like 10 years ago to a different type of brake for their trains. And these brakes are exclusively built in the West. Mm -hmm. What are they going to do? No longer brake? <laughs> when the train runs, right? Right, right, so right. Inevitably, yeah. Russian trains will stop running. Mm -hmm. Well, then they will stop. Yeah, they, because they can't break anymore, right? And and yeah. so, um, supply chain becomes very, very important when the physical security breaks down. Because right. you know you can have a great idea anywhere in the world. It has to be built somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be lower value add, even though. Uh, 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 TSMC is, is a fantastic operator, for example. But it's like this Ricardian um, model of where I build it in the most efficient place and put it together. Right. Right. right? right. Um, can be threatened, you know, through actions in the real world. Right. Right. And so I, I just wanted to go back to our previous, because it sounds like we're now slowly moving to our second agenda item, which are the key risks to U.S. tech technology leadership today in this environment. And obviously, um, the whole Russia situation is, is and the the war in Ukraine is a factor. But I wanted to go back really quickly and, and just address um, the U.S. tech leadership and the the let's call it the competitive threat and so you know while for years we've kind of you know you mentioned complacency and i really uh, appreciate you bringing that up i think it's important because you know while i hear a lot of folks talk about and, and through the years and i've done a lot of work in asia um that asian countries and economies and firms don't innovate um, that's no longer true, right? So if you look at companies in China, in South Korea, in Japan, they are inventing. And, and so I think it, it, th this whole notion of complacency is something that um, we should not appreciate because the fact of the matter is in terms of, uh, you know, 
um, patents that are being filed globally, um, the corpus of um, Asian economies are issuing a lot. And it's not just in terms of volume. I know there's a lot of uh, argument about whether or not patent count really is a good measure of quantity, right? Right. But the fact of the matter is, is you know, if you go and you really do the, the research into what kind of patents are being filed and you look forward and what are some of the critical investments that need to be made in infrastructure and, and just foundational technologies for the tech industry, these guys, you know, they're collectively uh, investing in, and, and also inventing things that are very going to be very pivotal pivotal yeah. going forward especially china has you know a lot of the foundation of chinese um uh ingenuity has come from from the west and mm -hmm. either the company came no voluntarily or involuntarily right that has certainly happened there is still uh, industrial espionage going on. We all know that. Mm -hmm. There's no denying around it. But at the same time, that is no longer the sole uh, engine of, of that innovation. And, right. and partially invention in China. Yeah. And we should not underestimate that. Right. Uh, yeah. They are... China has been, you know, prior to 1830, basically the cradle of civilization on the globe right it had it, it was uh you know at times you know for the longest time of human history it has been 25 30 percent of the of of global gdp right we, we with our european centric perspective we ignore that we we look at at how uh we look at how great the Roman Empire was, which was great, without a doubt. Uh, but then we forget the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, right? They lay a, laid a foundation, but China, without a doubt, was ahead of us. It's just then innovation and invention died there. And it and in the West, and especially in Europe, it, it flourished. And then we had a... You know, the last 500 years were, were the European and, in extension, the US, American uh, years of dominance, right? And that pendulum, to a certain extent, is, is swing, swinging back. And uh, it's slightly because we, we get a little bit complacent and the others are, are doing everything they can to, to catch up. And, right. yeah. and you have when when you look compare China 40 years ago to today, it's night and day. It is night and day, right? Yeah. Nobody right. has gotten richer in a shorter period of time than than the Chinese people. And uh, you know, a lot of people ask, like, you know, with China, why are these people not rebelling? Why, why are they not uh, fighting uh, the, the communist dictatorship? Uh, and the reason is they've never had it this good. Uh, that doesn't mean that there is an income inequality that still needs to be addressed, but that is one of the things that they're working on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right? And, 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 but also, it also um, is a, well, I don't know if you, you could say that this is a, a reality, that they still continue to have a massive pool of, um, you know, cheap labor. And, yeah. and, but yeah. at the same time, it's nowhere in the world are more, more robots being used than in China. Nobody stops us. Right. From right. They, they work equally cheap here than there, right? Uh, so uh, I think the the argument that oh, it's only built on cheap labor uh, is getting increasingly invalid, because as their income goes up, and and their 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 wealth and their affluence goes up, and they rightfully deserve it, their cost advantage merely on labor is going ever down, right? And, right, and they're right. doing that through, through uh, industrialization and, and mechanization 
of their of their production lines. Mm -hmm. Their true advantage lies in the supply chain, mm -hmm. not necessarily in the um, in in how cheap it is. That 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 has largely sold sailed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's similar to Amazon. People came to Amazon and bought things because it was the cheapest there. Mm -hmm. If you do comparison shopping, Amazon is no longer the cheapest. Right, 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 yeah, right. That's why people buy it. Oh, I can get it right. tomorrow. Oh, yeah. it's three dollars different. I don't care, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, yeah. In, to a certain extent, the same thing with with China. Uh, so it's not just cheap anymore. They have become really, really smart. They you know, and, and have built really, really cool things. And it, it, it's shame on us if we let other people catch up. We had we had a leadership position, and typically you can only give up your leadership position if you right. if you decide to trip yourself. Yeah. But I, I, I think one of the things that we also need to appreciate and be aware of, and sometimes I feel like we're not, is where we actually lead. <laughs> and be clear on that. Right and continue to and and so we'll maybe talk about that a, a little bit later. But let's move on to our second <laughs> agenda topic because we're having too much fun with the first one. Is the key risk to leadership in today's environment? You've already brought up one, which is the uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, now I, I think we've touched on some of the things around the U.S. Um, China tensions. Uh, obviously, with the the supply chain, the risk that it presents there, um, the tension uh, between the U.S. and uh, China as it relates to Taiwan. Obviously, many of the the advanced node uh, manufacturing is happening in Taiwan itself. Uh, that obviously being uh, it. South Korea, South Japan, Korea, right? Japan. You know, if, if things go off in Taiwan, they go off. Uh, from Japan down to to Malaysia. Right, right, right. China is a big country. <laughs> yeah, it is. It has now it the is. largest navy in the world. It has the largest army in the world. You know, we can talk about how good they are, but they're putting yeah. a lot of money in this, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and oh, that's that's you know what I'd love to get into that. Because I'm a big military buff, uh, but <laughs> let's save that for some other discussion. Okay, but you're tempting me. It, 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 it's a really interesting topic. But um, the other thing, I, I think um, the, the risk that we um, uh, maybe don't talk about enough, and this is really uh, looking at things from a market perspective and market perspective, is... Um, the the threat it really sort of this threat to uh, the primary growth market for our u.s semiconductor companies right and tech company many tech companies actually and that you know for instance if you look at uh, our, our our top semiconductor companies at least a quarter of the revenue if not more in so certain instances uh almost up to 70 percent uh come from north uh northern asia and so that's like Taiwan plus the mainland and as you pr are probably well aware there's a pretty there's a pretty uh, hefty tie between um, Taiwan and the mainland uh, as it you know as it relates to the semiconductors as well as uh, electronics manufacturing so um, that that's another um, risk dimension that I think needs to be considered and treated. Uh, pretty uh, seriously, uh, and um, I think some my my impression that it gets discounted sometimes. I don't know what you think, uh, Roger, but I'd love to get your take. Well, on on one hand, China is a huge market, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think the uh, the percentages of what goes into Northern uh, Asia are exaggerated because manufacturing happens there so the our semiconductors go to say china mm -hmm. get put together in the device mm -hmm. and then get shipped to everywhere in the world including back into the united states right europe and so on and so forth so uh a lot of that uh if and when supply chains shift mm -hmm. 
that will shift as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when, when you look at one of the lessons of the war in, in, uh, in Ukraine uh, is that supply chains will diversify. It is inevitable. Mm -hmm. It will know that because suddenly what has been currently priced in as zero, which mm -hmm. is supply and chain security, right. has suddenly become and gotten a value. Mm -hmm. And when that value gets factored in, mm -hmm. supply chain locations somewhere else become more attractive, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point that you're making there. And so, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. What you're suggesting here is there is going to be a uh, a let's call it a secure supply chain premium that needs to be paid. Yes. Right. Absolutely. And and that's going to be right. Right. So uh, that we 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 build in multiple places mm -hmm. that. Right now, it's a clearly, a, from an economics perspective, Ricardian model. You build it wherever it is the cheapest, and you concentrate everything there. And that only works if that location is perfectly secure. The moment you have to factor in that location gets disrupted, and it doesn't matter if it gets disrupted by an earthquake, a mudslide, a fire, a war, a hostile government, you name it, that holds you hostage, there is a premium that has to come in. And over the last 40 years, especially since, or, or especially over the last 30 years, since the, the, the fall of the, uh, the, the wall, uh, that premium was zero. And that's, where, that's why these things moved to where they moved, right? Um, and we've seen even before what, what has happened, that supply chains have moved back. Like a lot of German companies uh, moved their supply chain to, to Southeast Asia only to pull it back, largely because of quality reasons. But now we will also do that for security reasons. Right, right, right. Yeah, and um, I think those are great points. And uh, I want to move on to our next topic here, which is... Um, how does the U.S. tech industry sustain leadership? Um, invent, oh. invent, invent, right? <laughs> That's what it comes down to. Right. Hire the smartest people on the planet mm -hmm. and have them come here. Mm -hmm. it, this is all a people business. And right. so, you know, I came to the U.S. I'm not one of the smartest people in the world, but uh, by, by far... But I came to the U.S. and I contributed a little bit. Mm -hmm. When you look at the percentage of immigrants that started these tech leaders, they, there is a sizable percentage uh, that, that are either immigrants or, 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 or children of immigrants. And so one of the things we have to do is, is allow immigration to this country and bring the smartest, brightest people here. Uh, right. Because when we don't have that, you know, I love PR people, but I'm sorry, PR, PR people are not bringing us wonderful new products and, and, and inventions, right? Uh, they all have their role, but that's yeah. not one bit, right? They will do wonderful PR also for products coming from China. We know that. Right, right, right. Yeah, and I think the one of the big challenges uh, and, and the things that we do that um, the U.S. needs to do is uh, not just uh, um, you know build the institutions for higher education and uh, and you know technical training, what have you. Uh, it, we need to invest in uh, in also keeping folks who come like you said from other countries to learn in our um you know our um education or universities and and such and 
bring them into the fold, retain them. Because I don't, to your point, I don't think, and I know this for a fact that it didn't happen with Taiwan. <laughs> the reason why, it's not like magically Taiwan became a leader in semiconductor manufacturing and electronics. Uh, there was a huge investment that was made by the Taiwanese uh, individuals, maybe, you know, government, what have you. Um, but the, there's decades of educating their their workforce, their uh, people, to make these in, these huge leaps in industrial advancement, right? And, and same same goes with South Korea, where they I think a few years ago they had the highest per capita uh, PhDs uh, in the world, right? And it and. Fifty was a destroyed country. It was utterly broken, <laughs> devastated beyond belief. Yeah. Right? Oh, and it was the poorest, one of the poorest countries in the world fifty years ago. Yes. Yeah. And and, and then they turned it around, and yeah. you know, and then the next thing that we need is you know we need the right people, and then we need the we need the right framework. Right. We need to invest in invention and investment friendly uh, regulatory and legislative framework. Right. Money, money is fungible. Money will go wherever it will make the most money. And so we need to build a system where and, and maintain a system where where success is rewarded. Right. Right. Yeah. I, 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 I agree. Rewarded in both on, on both ends. Right, right. But these high jet tech jobs pay a heck of a lot of money, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When I hear that Google engineers feel they're under undervalued when they make two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand dollars a year, mm -hmm. I'm like, good for you, mm -hmm. and okay, you know, what have I done? What have I done wrong in my life? But that's okay. <laughs> um, right? It's like. Uh, same here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, that's yeah. In, that's invention and innovation, and that's right. really, really high-paying jobs uh -huh. because it can be sold globally. And so we, right. it, it's a, it, you know, it, it's the, the ship rise with that with, with with the with the tides, right? Right. And we right. Need the tide to rise. Right. 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 Agree, and, and 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 so, I think one of the things that is going to be vitally important is getting the whole IP battleground right. At you know our strategy right. I mean, you you've mentioned invention quite a bit. Hand in hand with that is, uh, you know, I you know intellectual property, and how we enforce it, how we, uh, you know, uh, promote it, right. On a global level, because you know now we're starting to see the Chinese and the South Koreans and especially the Chinese now, now that they're getting shut out in certain ways, they're seeing that oh okay, there's value in our IP, and so you see companies like Huawei, uh, almost ironically, right, going to different handset makers and uh, NEPs, telling them hey, um, pay up the royalty now. You know, well, or that used to be something that was, you know, they, they cross licensed. Uh, they're not doing that anymore, you know. And so the game is changing. They're asserting their IP and we need to continue to make sure that our IP assertions, uh, you know, uh, land on the, the shores of, uh, of the mainland as well. Yeah. And that, you know, um, yeah. And, and then, you know. We should also bring manufacturing back here, mm. uh, which will lead to, to jobs, but mm. a lot of it will be done by, by robots, but mm. simply for supply chain diversification, mm. we have to do that. And, yeah. and if the price premium of bringing it back, when you build a highly automated system, right? It doesn't matter yeah. anymore where you build it. And if, if the if the premium between building it in China or building it in in, in in another place where it is less secure and less friendly to here, I think that price premium should be covered by by the by the US, right? right. I don't think 
I'm I'm a big opponent of corporate welfare, uh, right? Whenever I hear like yeah. uh, a new football stadium gets built, you know, like what did I read it? Like uh, with the Buffalo Bills, yeah. right? that Buffalo gets a new football stadium. But why why do billionaires need two hundred fifty million dollars out of the one billion dollar yeah. so that you're covered by the taxpayer? I don't get that. Right, 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 right. Uh, whereas I get it if. If if Intel uh, Intel can build their their fabs wherever they want to, and I think it's great that they're building it in Ohio, mm-hmm. and I think the government should pay the difference between whatever it costs the difference between them building it in Ohio and them building it in you name the country, right? That difference, yeah. and maybe buck more, right? To to give a good incentive. Yeah should be here right and yeah. and it's very similar that we build that then also in among our allies say you know germany uk you name it yeah and, and you know i i mean i generally agree with what you're saying but i think one of the things that you're you seem to be alluding to i don't know if you're doing it intentionally or not but if we're going to reshore uh we need to be do it thoughtfully um, just bringing all forms of manufacturing over, it, it, I don't think is necessarily going to help us uh, meet the ends that we're pursuing here. Um, it can actually be detrimental if we do it wrong. I think the, it, we look at it as an opportunity to leapfrog what's already over in Asia. And if we fail to do that, um, then we create a... A, 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 an opportunity actually for them over in other regions, whether it's Asia or even in Europe, to uh, leapfrog us uh, because they're they're not stopping. You know, one of the things I wanted to mention is that there seems to be this growing uh, West versus East rhetoric that's going on in the tech industry, and, and you know, uh, one of the things that I think we might not be conscious of is the fact that some of this rhetoric is inspiring um, uh, Asian economies to now uh, take a, you know, uh, to look at investing more and uh, you know, inspiring them uh, to invest in becoming more competitive, right? Whether it's yeah, Taiwan, it's yeah, with uh, South Korea. And so I, I think one of the things that we, we need to really be cautious about is you know like for instance the semiconductor industry is a cyclical industry just lately it hasn't been but are you know going back to your statement before are we making the right investments in capital i don't think um uh, capital actually especially nowadays goes where it should simply because there there's this thing that i kind of dub the speculative culture that's uh, the kind of developed around all this crypto stuff and the reddit plus you know robin hood um it's not necessarily the case that um uh money follows returns and and that's where um you know i think we need to get better um because it 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 might not necessarily be the case that we are better at placing capital and maybe that's a retrospective that we need to do uh, based on what we've seen over the years with these unicorns and haven't gone anywhere you know i've gotten high valuations and um haven't really found out i'm a strong believer that what's good for the goose is good for the gander right Mm -hmm. in in inventing uh and and investing in your economy Mm-hmm. is a good thing regardless of the country uh that we talk about right yeah okay and, and yeah. i'm very happy if chinese are investing in china if south koreans are investing in in south korea japanese in japan and mm-hmm. germans in german and french in french right mm-hmm. and south africans in south africa yeah. Uh, that, that's how they re- ri- uh, increase their living standard i think everybody right. should should increase right. their living and if if we don't make the right decisions for us, then shame on us. Right, right. right. Uh, it is a it, it is an eco- it, it is a competition, and it, it, it's a competitive it industry. And com- competition means, which we like to forget, means there are winners and losers. Right, and we're not always winners, you know. 
as the as the the the, the textile industry here, right? Yeah, and right. some losses, some losses are are good for the country, and some losses are bad for the country. Yeah, and like, uh, I think when, for example, we needed to lose the textile industry, mm-hmm. we didn't we didn't need, and we shouldn't have ha- have left the people who worked in the textile industry behind. Right. Yeah. I say, totally agree. You know, uh, too bad. You know, no longer. <laughs> Move to Italy. <laughs> yeah. Go, go to wherever. <laughs> That's right? it's not that finish, bad. Yeah. You know? And and take the take their stuff. Yeah. What well, what what is missing is that in this technological change in the United States, that these people should be retrained, uh-huh. and that there should be investment. That when the textile mill goes away, yeah, that something else comes and gives the, these people. A better paying job. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, um, and that's where I think the, the 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 country overall can help. That's the role of the 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 government, both state and federal, to to help the transition from a from an economy of yesteryears to an economy of tomorrow. Right. So let's move on to our final topic here on that note, because I think that's a good first bullet point. I don't know I mean, if you agree or not, but uh, how can Paul, what, what are your uh, thoughts or recommendations to policymakers to support competitive innovation? And I guess if we were to start with the economy for this, this uh, discussion topic, I mean, what you just said is, is important, right? It's innovating and uh, modernizing your your uh, your workforce, and yeah, your- and, oh, and, right. and and help companies to succeed. You know, mm-hmm. one of the, the 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 works I've been most proudest of that I've done is for for several years I was on a, a National Science Foundation uh, panel, mm-hmm. um, and w- I don't think what a lot of people know is that. Every federal agency that spends more than a hundred million dollars on on research has to put has to put together a a, a research initiative to fund uh, ideas that are uh, worthwhile funding that might not be get funded by private uh, by pri- by VC funds. DARPA is the most well known of these programs, but every government agency has that. There are like 22, 22 of them. And so uh, I was on a stage two panel, which, you know, for stage one, uh, people said, I have this great idea. Uh, give me $100,000 and I'll investigate, right? And uh, they went through the selection process. And you would imagine that after you about half come back, this wasn't a good idea, and half would say it was a good idea. Uh, 90% of people think that it's a good idea, right? And and the job of, of and then, then there's stage two, which is like two panels. One is a tactical panel. I was on the commercial panel. And if they could convince us that they should really take us to the next level, the government would invest in it. Uh, another $250,000. And if they got venture funding, the government would match the venture funding one to one for like up to a million dollars. Oh wow! And it's grant money. It's not you don't have to right. pay it. Right. So uh, that type of program that really supercharges that makes that makes high risk problems because we were specializing on problems that were too risky, too forward looking for VC funding, but we thought it was interesting. Right. So if anybody is out there who, who is uh, has a great idea, these uh, SBI, uh, SBIR, STR, STTR programs are available from every government uh, program, a uh, uh, government uh, bureau. And so uh, we have to do things like that, that we double down on these uh, and government can help. On, on funding the high risk, which means not one out of 10 will succeed, but maybe only one out of 100. Mm. But that 100 will make all the difference, right? 
it's the idea that was too risky for, for, for VC funding and angels. We thought it was a good idea. Here's some money. Try and, and do it better. So that's one of the things. And I think, you know, we, we need to, uh, to even regulation, right? Uh, we shouldn't have regulatory arbitrage in this country. Uh, when you look at it, uh, you know, uh, the small companies always call, uh, call for regulation against big companies. But what they often don't realize is that the biggest friend of regulation uh, or of regulation is actually the big companies. When you look at, at Europe, GDPR, it made life so much easier for, for Facebook and Google uh, in Europe. And they increased market share and the little guys lost because they co the cost of, of observing the regulation was simply too high. So yeah, it's like a, yeah. an even regulatory playing field and not only within an industry, but across industries, right? Otherwise you do regulatory arbitrage and you're picking winners and losers. And I don't think government should pick winners and losers. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um... I, I do say that we do need to come up with some sort of, um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I guess response to some of the planned economic development that oftentimes is characteristic of what um, Asian economies do. Well, they have a longer time horizon. And one of the things what we need is, and I know it's funny, bipartisan, you know, bipartisan agreement of what is important and what do I, we fund? Because not everything yes. goes in a four-year cycle or even a two-year cycle. Right. Yes. And and, and yeah. I, I think that, and so the one thing that I would add to your, your list would be exactly that, is that um, policymakers need to understand that the tech industry is very complex technology that gets invented and feeds into the whole commercial cycle and helps us lead in the markets. It, that's that whole dynamic. All, all of it is very complex and that um, generalizations are, are, are really dangerous uh, when it comes to policy making in this industry. Um, and and, and I, I think one of the big challenges that policymakers have is developing that level of awareness of the important nuances that will uh, help them maybe evade and uh, more importantly see some of the potential unintended consequences of policy. You know, and I think that's one of the most challenging things that uh, U.S. policymakers face today, because a lot of what is going to be strategically important, that, like you said, doesn't feel good. It has a longer time horizon, and you really, the policymakers on both sides of the aisle somehow need to come to an agreement and sell that long-term vision. And then somehow uh, we need to be able to, as a country and economy, stick to that. Uh, otherwise, it's really going to be difficult to, um, you know, have a um, have a uh, coordinated response to uh, coordinated responses. Exactly. No, I'm with you, hundred <laughs> percent. Well, hey, Roger, this has been really, really cool. And that's the only word I can. That's the only word that I can use to describe this session. So um, you know, uh, I want to thank you so much for joining me on this rethink uh, webcast. You've made it a very special one. Uh, I think our audience is going to love it. And so, why don't you take a moment to to um, let our audience know how they can reach out to you find out more about the research and the wonderful work that you do at Recon Analytics? Well, some of the things that we let the, the, the public see is on our website, reconanalytics.com. Uh, I write on Fierce Wireless uh, pretty regularly and, uh, and, and other Fierce uh, properties uh, uh, with some interesting tidbits. And then I also have a podcast called The yeah. Week with Roger, which is 
the week with Roger.com, where you can listen every week to uh, to different insights and different things yeah. than what Leonard does here. And so it's wonderfully com uh, complementary. So if you have 15 yeah. minutes, typically, yeah. <laughs> And if you have an if you have, if you have an hour or more, you come to me. <laughs> no, that's great, and uh, yeah, you know, um, it, it shouldn't come to a surprise that you're really good at this stuff since you have your own podcast, and it's a wonderful one. I highly recommend everyone check it out. It, it's great stuff. No, really appreciate being here. Thank you very much. It uh, was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, and, and to our listeners and viewers, thanks for joining us. Please subscribe to our YouTube and Apple podcast channels. The easiest thing to do is just go to our research portal and media center at www.next-curve.com. Uh, it's a great one-stop shop for all Next Curve research and uh, content and media. And you'll be notified when we publish new articles and content such as this webcast with the illustrious Roger Entner. And uh, so until next time, be safe and stay healthy. Roger, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Visit us at www.next-curve.com.